Ladies and gentlemen, let us open the first part of the program, which is the keynote lecture given by Jan Vitek. Professor Jan Vitek received his PhD from University of Geneva. Most of his academic career spent at Purdue uh, till 2014, and since then, since 2014, he is full professor at Northeastern University in Boston, United States, which is a private university, one which is uh, getting uh, dynamic uh, research development in the last few years, and Jan Vitek is one of representatives of key research area of, of that university in programming languages. Uh, Jan Vitek is also known as a person who is active in organizing conferences uh, and, and serving community. He served as a chair of SIGPLAN, for example, chief editor of Journal of Object Technology. Uh, he has uh, been PI of uh, many projects. Uh, one possibly interesting project ended up with development of Java real-time virtual machine, which has been implemented in uh, Boeing drones and similar other projects. And uh, we are especially proud of uh, having Jan Vitek at the faculty since last year, since uh, September 2016. Uh, and the reason is that he was awarded uh, the advanced ERC grant in computer science and his talk will be actually in this direction. So this is one of the first uh, advanced ERC grants in this country in computer science. So Jan, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, thank you all, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. So as Pavel said, I've worked in programming languages in Java but this talk is slightly different. I'm going to be talking about data analysis. And I've started becoming interested in that area about five years ago, when I was on a sabbatical in Palo Alto and I was switching between three jobs. I had an office in Stanford, I had a desk in a startup, and I was working with a research team at Oracle Labs. At the startup, what we were doing, the startup is called H2O.ai, and what we were doing was building a platform for in-memory distributed computing. So think uh, running machine le learning algorithms on clusters. And my job there was to implement a distributed random forest algorithm. At Oracle, we're working on a long-term project who, that aimed to inject inside of the Oracle database a data analysis language to allow for very quick analysis of data without going out of process. So both of these uh, projects gave me interest and little background in data analysis. And since then, I've been looking at ways to apply my experience in programming language technologies to the field of data analysis. So, data analysis, a very rough description of it is the process of turning data into information. And it touches on all the problems that are exciting and hot in our field, from machine learning, data mining, big data, big code, all of them are related to data analysis. So what I want to do today in this talk is to talk about what is the state of data analysis in practice today, how people do it, what do they do, how do they, what tools do they use, and in particular, I'm interested in languages and abstractions, so what languages and abstractions do people use to express problems in this field, and how can we improve those? And then uh, I will try to give you some ideas of what you know, we could do in the next 10 years to improve the state of the art. All right. So 
If we're going to talk about data analysis, we need something concrete to look at. We need a starting point. So what is a starting point? Well, there is a company called Rexer Analytics that does these studies every year of what data miners like to use in their day-to-day -day job. So this is a data miner. And according to Rexer Analytics, 76% of them prefer to use the R language for their day-to-day -day data mining tasks. Actually, this year, Rexer Analytics changed the name. They're not data miners anymore. They're data scientists. Data science is more politically correct. So if we want to look at m something that looks slightly more scientific, here's a bar graph that looks better. And the bar graph says, well, which tools do people use on a day-to-day -day basis in that field? Um, it's a survey of about 1,600 individuals. And what you can perhaps see is the uh, overwhelming dominant uh, tool is R. And other tools on that list include SPSS, SAS, Excel, Tableau, uh, MATLAB, what else, uh, Mathematica, and a bunch of others. The one thing that stands out if you look at this picture is not only does R is R used about twice as much as any other tool, but if you look at the green bars, you'll see that R is used uh, as a primary tool about five times more often than any other tool. All right. So all of this to motivate that we're going to be talking, uh, taking R as our representative of the state of the art. And it's not completely unreasonable to do so. Let me give you another unscientific uh, bit of, of data. Here are books that you can find on Amazon on, the topic, uh, on topics that use R. And if you look at these, you'll see it goes from finance to ecology to soil mapping to political analysis, bioinformatics, uh, social media mining. So it is a very broad set of topics that people have, uh, have, have approached. And they found that uh, R was a useful data analysis tools in all of these. So all right. So what, I've, what I've, I'm going to argue is let's take R as our starting point, And then let's look at how people use it in data analysis this tax, uh, tasks. W let's look at what it is as a language. And let's look whether it will be useful to solve all problems, or maybe you know, it has limitations, and these limitations we should look at. So the first part of the talk is about the history of R. And really, I want to give you a, a feeling that how, or I want to give you an idea that it is kind of surprising and amazing that a language and a system that has never received governmental funding, that has never had a company be behind it, that was developed by a bunch of part-time, well, they're full-time statisticians, but part-time software developers, managed to become more widely accepted than all of these commercial systems that I listed on the previous slide. So how did that happen? Well, let's, let me first tell you a little bit about what R is, because it, uh, it may need not be familiar to uh, us all. So R is a system for statistical computing and graphics. That's, that's how it names it, uh, describes itself. By some metrics, there are over 2 million users. Not sure that you know, those metrics are scientific, but yeah, whatever. Uh, much more practical and actually countable, there are uh, over 11,000 open source packages containing statistical method, visualization, all of that on the CRAN archive. That's the, uh, open source archive of packages. 
Um, another metric of interest is uh, the number of questions on Stack Overflow. There are over close to 200,000 question and answer threads on Slack Stack Overflow. So that represents a, a wealth of, of knowledge embedded there. And for comparison, here's um, a chart of Stack Overflow questions where I've plotted the uh, proportion of questions talking about R with the proportion of questions talking about another language. And you can, well, you can see the trend, right? The, uh, there is a, a steady growth of R and the other language has a steady, steady decline. Why is that? I'll give you one hypothesis. The other language is a niche language. It is not a general purpose language at all. It is a niche language for the niche of people like us with computer science training. And that's a small number of people. R is a language that addresses pretty much anybody in science. So you will have user from biology to finance, which is a much larger population. Thus, a, a steady increase in, in questions on Stack Overflow. Um, so, and also R has a user conference and a vibrant user community. All right, so where does R come from? It didn't come from nowhere, it came from where all good things come. It came from AT&T. Uh, it came from AT&T where uh, about 40 years ago, the um, statisticians at AT&T decided to work on trying to make John Tukey's vision concrete. So John Tukey was a statistician at AT&T Labs, and he had this idea that in statistics, most of the time you do confirmatory data analysis. You have a hypothesis, and you use a statistical method to estimate that hypothesis, true, wrong, within some, some bounds. But what he was interested in, Tucky was interested in, was something else. He was interested in, in exploratory data analysis. He wrote a book about it, he coined the term. And his idea was that there's a very different way to approach data, which is to approach it without any a priori, without any hypothesis. And by interacting with data, to try to elicit a set of hypotheses, that then you can confirm or infer. So, uh, in order to support this approach, what the AT&T team was started working on was a language called S. And the leaders of that team were John Chambers and uh, Richard Becker. What they thought was, well, at AT&T we have this really great set of libraries for statistics. They're written in Fortran, people like them, and you can use them for confirmatory data analysis but they're really lousy at exploratory. Why? Well, because to use one of those libraries, you have to write a Fortran program. The Fortran program does always the same thing. It reads in data, it formats it, it calls the routine, takes the data out, puts it out on file. And it's a lot of work and it's no fun. So let's invent a very simple language, a glue language that would allow us to avoid writing this and just allow us to string a few of these routines together. Essentially, the goal of the language was to standardize data format and calling conventions. And that was all they wanted to do. They uh, came out with the language in 76. Then in 78, they jumped on the Unix bandwagon because of portability and tooling. And that gave them the ability to you know, compile on many platforms. It was easier for other people to adopt S. By 85, they had written the S book, and AT&T had decided that maybe there was some money to be made, and they had uh, spun off S as its own startup. So, where does R come, come from? R comes from New Zealand from uh, these two gentlemen, or these two scientists, one of them is called Gentleman, the other one is called Ihaka, and what their idea was, 
we need a language to teach statistics that is free. And they looked around. They liked S, but it was too expensive. So they decided that Scheme was the right starting point. They looked at the existing implementations of Scheme, but they thought they were too big and too complicated. So they decided, let's start one of our own. They wrote an interpreter, which was all of 1,000 lines. And then they announced this on the S mailing list. And one thing led to another. They started to become more and more compatible with S because they wanted to reuse some of their, the code they had written. And eventually, they became somewhat backward compatible with some differences. Then about 2000, they released the first version of R, and so on. Just as a sanity check, today, the implementation of R is 800,000 lines of C and R code. So a little bit of complexity crept in uh, in the intervening years. R would not be a success if it was just a language. There is uh, another key element of its, uh, of its uh, you know, sort of uh, increased adoption, and this is the uh, CRAN archive network. So CRAN was modeled on the LaTeX and Perl archive networks, or it started in 97, but it has some key differences from those, those previous uh, archives. So one of the, uh, the key points about CRAN is any package that is submitted to CRAN is in a standardized format, contains a vignette. A vignette is a piece of text describing the package with inter intermingled executable code and data. So the vignette is both your man page and you know, something you can cut code, uh, co take code from and paste it in the interpreter and run. And then tests. Any package that is submitted to CRAN has to pass test, has to have test, and, and the test has to run. If they don't run, the package will not be accepted. And CRAN tests everything on three releases of R, 12 OSs, seven architectures, though probably six because Spark is go uh, soon because Spark is dying. So, and most importantly, there is manual communication with the developers. If a package stops working, they will go back, talk to the developers. If the developers don't respond, the package will be archived. So you have 11,000 running programs with tests and data, which is quite, quite valuable. So uh, as a software engineer, it's a great wealth of runnable code. Uh, there's a nice, uh, nice curve here, which is the number of packages over time from 97 to 2016. Nowadays, they get about six new packages, six accepted packages a day, and 200 up updates. And everything has to be tested, right? OK. So, so I've talked about our history and argued that you know, I told you where it comes from, uh, some of elements of its ecosystem. Now I will tell you a few words about what it is as a language object. Uh, not too much, but just you know a little bit, so you have a feeling. Um, so in 2012, 12, we wrote a paper describing the design of R and criticizing it a little bit, gently. So if you if you've ever used R and felt that this it is that it is a monstrosity, that's okay. Everybody knows that in computer science terms. The statisticians love it. So what is R? Well, R is a vectorized language. By that, we mean that every basic value is a vector. You can't have a number three. You have a vector that contains three. Everything is vectorized. Every operation plus takes vectors, returns vectors. 
Okay? So that's, that's basic operation, which means that as our users, you never write loops, or very rarely. It is dynamic. No types code can be created on the fly. It is lazy, so if a, if a computation only happens on demand. It is uh, functional, both in the sense of having first order functions and also in the sense of having uh, referential transparency on calls. And I'll tell you more about this. And there's a bunch of things that R isn't or doesn't do. All right, so I'll spend a couple of uh, minutes on three of those features that are worth understanding because they make it possible to do some of the things I will show you later. So the first thing is laziness. So if you've, if you've heard about languages like Haskell, they're a lazy programming language. R is slightly less lazy than Haskell because, well, because it has side effects and things get messy, but uh, I'll just explain the high level bit here. So imagine I wanted to write a function like assert. The purpose of the function assert is to evaluate the first argument. If it's true, do whatever the second argument does. So if I wanted to write assert in C, I would write a macro, right? That's easy. If I wanted to write assert in Java, eh, I would probably have to box the second argument in a lambda. In R, essentially every argument is auto-boxed into lambdas for you. So every argument is boxed into a closure and only evaluated if you need it. So on the, uh, the next slide, uh, I have the definition of assert. And it simply says assert has two arguments. It tests the first one. And if the first one is true, it runs the second one. Slightly more entertaining, you can, do the, uh, you can implement JavaScript with statement in R without any effort. So what is the with statement doing? Uh, it's evaluating the expression that is the second argument in the context of the data object that is the first argument. So typically, the first argument is a table that has two columns, carbs and carb and den. And what this does is multiply the two columns, or, uh, to, uh, multiply the two columns. And in order for this to work, you need to delay execution because carb and den are not in scope when you look at this statement. They're only in scope a little bit later. So laziness is critical for this. So this brings us to dynamism. So dynamism here means there are no types in R. You don't write types, but there are types in the impl implementation. The implementation will check that you don't do anything crazy. And you have the ability to computationally modify many aspects of the execution of a program. So this function I was showing you a second ago with, here's how we could implement it in R. So with is a function of two arguments. And uh, the first argument here is a data frame. So think of it as an object or a table. The second argument is an expression. And the way this works is substitute takes that expression we got and finds the code of that expression. So you can always do that in R. You can always find the original code that you know, was in the call to the function. And it turns it into an abstract syntax tree. And then we insert the df, that table, in the environment and call eval. So really that means take that expression and evaluate it in the environment provided by df. So this is very powerful. It's also very difficult to compile efficiently, and as we found out. Um, and that's a, one of the key properties of R that is used by many package developers. And the last thing uh, that I want to say about R, the language, is uh, the, the, uh, the call semantics. 
So imagine I have this vector x. Maybe x is containing uh, data that is quite valuable to me. I pass it to a function f in that call. And let's say that the function f in its body overrides one of the entries of the vector x. In R, the language gives me the guarantee that I will not see this. This will happen to a copy of x. My view of x will remain the same. And how does this work? Well, it's a copy on right in the sense that if of a value here I have this vector with, which is reachable from two different variables, if I have a, 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 a vector that is reachable from multiple variables, before um, performing the assignment, I will do a copy. So the result of assigning three to location one of x is I get two copies. All right. So this is as much of R I want to tell you about. We'll, it'll play a role in uh, later. So now, data analysis. So this bit of the talk, I want to take you through the steps of data analysis as you uh, would practice them if you were a student or a uh, data miner from the picture earlier. So the steps of data analysis are best described by a, a, a graphic that, was, that is due to Grolman and Wickham and uh, in their book, R for Data Science. So basically, uh, here the bold, uh, bold words are steps. The little light blue is uh, our example packages you can use. Um, so any uh, data analytic problem starts by importing the data. Then you tidy it, you clean it, you remove uh, all uh, peculiarities and encoding problem. Then you may transform the data. Sometimes you need to add variables or to summarize uh, in some way. And then you iterate. Iterate with visualization, mo statistical modeling, transformation. And that, that makes a cycle. After a while, you will get to a point where you're happy with your results. And then the next step of data analysis is you have to format your data in a way that you can communicate it, so HTML, PDF. And you also have, and this is getting more and more important, you also have to format your analysis in a way that it can be reproduced. And th this, is, this, is, this is really getting more crucial because R lets you do so many things to your data that you, know, you want to be able to convince people that what you did is correct. All right, so I will go through a couple of those steps in detail. Um, let's start with tidying. So ti tidying is the process of cleaning the data, validating the encodings, and reshaping the data. Uh, Hadley Wickham, who works at our studio, wrote this paper on tidy data, where he proposes this f the following three uh, uh, the following three st steps of tidying. He says, each variable should form a column, each observation should form a row, and each type of observational unit should be a data frame. If you re reformat this a little bit, it sounds like database normalization, right? Yeah? And there's no surprise. It, it, really, it, it really is. So how do we... How do we do this in practice? OK, let's start. Assume I have a little CVS file. I can read it. I can create a data frame for it. And I can assign it to the grades variable. And let's say I get this, this file. It's a file with five columns, three rows. The columns are, say, student ID, um, the test, whether it was a final or midterm, and then which, uh, which period of the year that test was taken. So if you look at that data for a second or two, you'll find that there's this weird question, question mark uh, in the second row. And what is that? Well, most likely somebody entered question marks for a student that didn't show up, but that's not the proper encoding. 
the proper encoding for a missing value in R is NA. And what, uh, and there's another one up there in winter. So we want to first clean up the data and say, get rid of any encoding errors. And in this case, we can use R's content addressing to say, well, any position in grades, if you think of grades as one big vector that has two question marks should be replaced with a NA. And this gives you, uh, this gives you the following table where now encoding is consistent. Good. So, you would think that a table with five, five rows and three, uh, uh, three rows and five columns can't be that wrong, and you would be wrong. It is actually very wrong. So, what is wrong with this 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 table? Uh, first, column headers, they're they're really values. So fall, spring, winter, they're not column headers, they're values. Try to imagine if this was not uh, uh, seasons, if this was months, you would have 12 months. If this was days of the year, you would have 365 columns. That makes no sense. Clearly that is uh, not uh, clean data. What else? Uh, missing observations. So some missing, bloop, some missing observations are in the data, which is okay. R supports them, knows how to do with them, but in some analyses, they will pollute our results. So we have to think about what to do with them. There's also some implicit missing observations. So the encoding of missing here was that, well, maybe one student, student did one, didn't show up for any midterm, so we decided to not put a row for him or her. So there is this missing row for one midterm. And that's, again, a problem with the data representation. Uh, there are different units in columns. If you look at this column, well, very likely your final is graded on a 100 scale, whereas your midterm is on a 20, and you're, you're comparing apples and oranges. Certainly not good. Uh, and then wrong data type. Here we're showing the data type of the column, and it says factor. In R, factor is a compressed string. And the reason why this says factor is when we inputted the data, there were two question marks, and uh, R thought that this column was strings, and since there were few values of strings in that column, it turned it into factor. So all of this to say this data is quite messy. And this is what you get every time. Every time you input data, be that from the government or anything, it'll be messy. So what do we do? Well, we clean it up. And um, here in R, we do this by uh, using essentially a domain-specific language for data cleaning. So this comes with a package, tidy R. And what this is, is um, a set of commands, this little pipe operator, this little uh, percent larger than operator is called a pipe. So the way to read this is I take the grades table and I feed it to mutate then I feed the result of mutate to, mutate to the next one, and so on. Um, and it is, uh, it is a domain-specific language because it uses reflection, and I'll tell you how it does it to perform its work. So this is the script, and I'll just tell you what, what it does in a minute or two. So the first step of a script is we want to get rid of that factor column for spring. So mutate at tells, uh, tells R to apply the function as character to the column spring. What that means is it turns the whole column to, a, to, str to, to strings, and then we pipe that into the next mutate at, which apply as integer, and this turns the column to integer. And the result is now we have all three columns of the same type. This is much nicer. Next step is we want to uh, take care of the implicit missings. So the implicit missings are, call, are rows, observations that are not present. So we use complete. Complete takes the two columns. Here these are names of columns, the ID and test column. And its, it's semantics is make sure that every combination of value of ID and test is in the table. So here we have two IDs and two tests, so there should be four 
observations. We have only three, so we need to make up one, and we will make it up by putting NAs everywhere. We could make it, uh, you could, we could complete it in other ways. This is the default. All right, so now we have got uh, taken care of that. So the next step is uh, gather. So uh, here, what we want to do is take care of the problem that we have fall, spring, and winter as column of their own, and instead turn them into something more regular that look like this. So we have a semester column, a score column, and the semester is either fall, spring, or so on. So we do this with this command where we say create a new semester column, create a score column, and take from fall to winter and stuff them in there. And then the next bit, we have this big table. Now what we want to do is take care of the problem that the score column has two units. Remember I said that there's the, the encoding for midterms is different than the encoding for uh, finals. So what we'll do is use spread, and we say spread test and score, and what this does is it will create, uh, it will take um, all of the final entries and put them in a new column of its own, and all the midterm entries and put them in a new column of its own. So, what, we've do, what have we done? We have gone from something that looked really simple, we found that it's completely bad and wrong, and we've cleaned it up in five lines of code. These lines of code were high-level specifications in a domain-specific language on top of R. All right, so there is a data transformation language, and it's part of the dplyr package, and it has a set of verbs for transforming data. And I will just give you a very, very uh, quick idea. If I wanted to compute for each student the count of how many, of how many uh, entries uh, there is, the mean of, its, of, of his or her final and midterm, and compute an average, uh, 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 a complete grade. I would do it this way. So here's what I want to get at the end. I want to get a new table that has counts, averages for finals and midterm, and a and total grade. So I would start by grouping by ID. This tells the, the system to, 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 to group all students by their ID. Then summarize the, uh, by counting how many uh, uh, entries there are in a group, create a mean, for the final, create a mean for the, the mean, and then compute out of those to, say, a final grade. Right, so same idea. There is a language of data transformation that's built on top of R, which is a grammar and, uh, and terms. So the, the, the last bit I want to talk about is visualization. And it's the same idea. R has a language for visualization, so it's built, it, it's based on the work of Leland Wilkinson, who used to be uh, uh, at IBM and now is uh, at H2O. And he wrote this book that tried to give an abstract grammar for all sorts of visualizations. The idea was you can use that grammar to, oops, sorry, that was too fast. Use that grammar, sometimes I'm not, uh, eliminations. Use that grammar to describe abstractly any visualization you want. And the interesting thing is he wrote this book without an implementation. It's like a big book and it's completely abstract. And then in R, there, uh, the ggplot package is an implementation of that grammar. So I'll give you just a few examples of how that works, just to give you a very quick feeling. So I'll use a data set that is about cars, it has miles per gallon, displacement, cylinders, not very interesting. All right, so the very simplest specification we can have in ggplot is one like this. We say, um, create, take the MPG data set as aesthetics, S set the X axis to be uh, the car model, the Y axis to be the highway consumption, 
and the geometric elements that will be in the figure to be bars. And what you get is this. There's, on the x-axis, you have all the cars. On the y-axis, their highway consumption. You can change that specification a tiny bit by saying, well, uh, instead of that, use the x-axis, uh, use for the x-axis the displacement, and the y-axis should be still the highway consumption, and use a point as your graphical element. What that gives you is this graph, right? Which doesn't say much, but mm, okay, so you, you see something. It's not clear what to make of it. Let's add some color. So here I'm just going to add color to this graph by saying the geometric points, well, they have another aesthetic attributes. That is, the color is the class of the car, whether it's an SUV, a pickup, or a two-seater. And if I do that, now something starts to emerge. You can see that at the bottom of the graph, where you have the worst consumption, you have two colors that are clustering. And these are pickup and SUVs. Makes sense. All right, we can add some more stuff to this. What we can do next is we can say, let's add size of the points and make, make the size of the points the number of cylinders. So look, now you can see uh, the more cylinders, the bigger point, the worse consumption. Small, uh, small number seems to have uh, better, better consumption. So you start to, uh, to see some data. And it's all very uh, declarative. So now uh, you can also declare other things. You can declare the theme. So this is the, the, the color scheme. So for instance, if you like the economist, here is me adding the economist theme. And the same figure suddenly looks like the, the economist. Say you don't want any aesthetics at all. You'll put the Excel team. And this will look like an, a graph generated by Excel. All right. Um, I like to make fun uh, of my friends at Microsoft. Uh, so that's graphics. The, the last bit here is reproducibility. I think it's really important that any data analysis environment has to have a story for reproducibility. R has it for a long time. So they started in 2001 with Sweeve, which was an implementation of NoWeb, which was an implementation of Knuth Ideas. So it was Latex and R combined. And now they have, they have Knitter, which is a Markdown and generates PDF, HTML, LaTeX, and whatever. So what's, what does that mean? Well, it means that you can write a document that has all of your analysis embedded in it. Every time you, you generate the document, you rerun your analysis. If you submit the document, submit it with the data, whoever gets it can rerun your, your, your analysis. And that is very simple, but very powerful, right? Because now statisticians can, don't need to say in so many words what they did. It's embedded in what they are submitting. All right. So. Uh, so we've seen R, we've seen what are the steps of data analysis. Now the, the question is, well, you know, where to next? And this brings me to the project uh, we're working on here at CTU in our ERC grant. So it's called Evolving Language Ecosystems. And the idea is that any language, say R or, A, A or Mathematica or anything in this space, is defined not by just the compiler or the virtual machine, but it's defined by that plus the libraries, the user code, your stack overflow. There's this huge ecosystem. And if we want to change a language, we can't just change the, the implementation. We have to have a story for how do you fix the C code that it's linking again? How do we fix the user code? So you have to have a story that talks about the whole stack and looks at the entire ecosystem. So that's the context. And in that context, we're looking an, at a number of problems that we find interesting and relevant to data analysis. Uh, so the first, the first issue we're looking at is scaling data sizes. So 
Um, R is well known to be really bad with large data, partly because it has a, it is not good, its footprint is pretty bad, and partly, well, because, well, machines are limited and so on. So the question is, if you have large data, what should you do? Clearly, people have tried things like Hadoop, Spark, and so on. Our feeling is that while Hadoop, Spark, and so on are very good for the Googles of this world, most labs and most research projects could do with simpler solutions. And we are trying to see how far can you push the simpler solution before you actually have to go to distributed large-scale clusters. And the reason is that the performance of distributed large safe cluster is so much worse than what you can get on one machine that you really have to have a problem that needs it before it actually pays off. So uh, Kylie Bemis, uh, who's at Northeastern, has been working on a system called Matter to transparently let R address data that is larger than memory. And in, in the context of our research, we've been working on trying to synthesize out of annotated R code uh, efficient traversal of data that is stored both on, uh, in memory and on disk. And we don't know whether this will work, but we, we have encouraging early results. The next big area we want to make advances in is uh, types. So I told you R has no types, and it's good because we wouldn't even know what types to write for most R programs. And if we knew what types to write, it would probably take a PhD in computer science to read them, and uh, most users would not put up with it. They'd rather either learn C++ or shoot themselves in the head. 50-50. So um, what to do? Well, one of my colleagues at Northeastern, Matthias Felizen, has been working on the concept of gradual typing. And this is something we want to explore for R. The idea of gradual typing is that you can add types only where you want it and need it, and leave the rest of the code alone. So in particular, we could type the internals of R, the implementations of libraries, and leave all the externals just as they are now, so end users wouldn't need to know that types exist. And we have good reason to believe this can actually work. This is a, a real piece of R code. It's a function that has three arguments, and then all of this nonsense below it is a type checking code that the, the programmer write, wrote by hand. And this is hard to read, hard to make sure what it does, and uh, wouldn't it be better if we could say the same thing like this? Say, well, X is a, either a matrix or something that converts to a matrix. Norms is a logical. And dims is a number in the range from 1 to dims of X. Yeah, that could work. So we're working on that. The next topic we're working on is uh, parallelism. So there are solutions for para parallelism in R, and usually what they amount to so is either run a particular operation in parallel, that means write this operation in C and write it parallel, or fork the R process into multiple processes. Neither is particularly appealing. What we've been experimenting with is uh, something we worked on in the context of another language called Julia with Intel. And for Julia, it worked really well. So the idea is we take a subset of R, and for that subset, if the program happens to be in the subset, we at runtime generate OpenMP uh, parallel code. And then the, 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 the game is to see whether the subset is big enough for you to write interesting programs, and if we can get speed ups. For Julia, we could get uh, excellent speed ups. So we'll, we'll be pushing on that for, uh, to, uh, on this, in this direction with R. And the last issue we want to work on is performance. So R 
So here's a, a fun graph that we captured in 2012, I think. So like 12 programs and their uh, performance relative to C code. So it's blue is Python, red is R, and the, the scale is logarithmic. So uh, the average, yes, well, I don't know, I forgot the, well, the average is, is about, the average slowdown for, for Python was like 30, if I recall, and uh, for R it was more like 200, and it goes to several hundred slowdowns over C. So uh, these are not representative R programs, these are just programs we could write in three languages, but what it says is if you're unlucky, you can write code that is massively slow. And certainly, we have seen many users experience that. Since then, uh, Tomasz Calibera, here from CTU, has worked with Luke Tierney to introduce a bytecode compiler in R, so we have sped up R by about a factor two, which is still way too slow. And uh, Oracle Research, which whom I, with whom I was collaborating, did this uh, Java compiler for R, where, which has uh, good performance, but it's not fully integrated in the R environment. And what we're currently working on is an LLVM-based just-in-time compiler that we can drop in as a replacement to the bytecode compiler. And we'll see how this goes. So I'm about out of time, so I'll go to the conclusions. So what did I try to tell you today? Well, I tried to tell you uh, a little bit about data analysis by giving you some examples of what it is in practice. I've uh, taken R as an example, but there are many other systems, right? It's not guaranteed that this will be the system people will use in five years or 10. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I think there is value in trying to evolve this particular system just because there's so much intellectual capital that has been invested in it. So many statisticians have developed these statistical methods. To redo that all in a new language, in Python, in Scala, will be a huge amount of work. I mean, we tried it. When I was working with Oracle, we, we were working to recode many things in Java, but even the simplest algorithm has so many complexities. So for instance, to give you just a fun data point, R has a random number generator. Well, it has several. Actually, there's 50,000 lines of random number generator code in R. And every single line is needed for somebody for something, right? So if we're going to re redo all of this, it's an amazing amount of work. So what are the takeaways from this talk? Well, uh, at the very start of this effort, in S land, in 76, it was all about interactivity. And still today, you want interactive manipulation of data. So whatever we do, whatever language we choose, it can't be Hadoop, because as interactivity goes, that sucks, right? Um, dynamism, the language has no types and is completely flexible. This is horrible if you're a compiler writer. This is horrible if you want to do correctness, but it has proved really useful for users and really good um, uh, as a, uh, to, to, to let people explore new abstractions and domain-specific languages. Uh, a language is an ecosystem, right? It is all of the things around it. So if, you, if somebody like, you know, I have friends working on Julia, they want to create a new language, Julia will have to de develop all of that ecosystem. And that's a lot of work. And there has to be a strong community. So even if you, you, know, if you want to, do, to redo R somewhere, you have to have a strong community of people who are invested in it. In R, people, you know, the people spend their lives working on this. So you, know, you have to find people willing to give that much. And with that, I will conclude and thank you. Uh, 
Um, so the first question is, is the R semantics formally defined? We tried, I mean, f a little bit in 2012, and then we gave up. There's 800,000 of lines of code, and that's pretty much the semantics of R. It's a horrible state. We would like to change it, but we don't know how. Question one. Question two was, what is the contribution of R to reproducibility? I think it's this, what I was telling you with this repository of running code and this tradition of writing, uh, writing things in either Sweeve or uh, R Markdown so that you can actually share the, the code with others. And if everybody does it, I think we'll be much better off. Okay, second question. Over there. Right. Oh, yeah. How do you see its uh, capabilities for real, uh, with, uh, respect to R? And do we have, is, there, is, is he representing the third option? Like right. Because you left up with either C or with R. Or, yeah. Uh, so, Python. Uh, Python is, a, is definitely a popular choice. The, the main issue are you have to get to the point where you have that library, you know, all of the routines developed, and that's a long road. I think Python is a favorite of people with computer science training, because it's a sane language. Okay, <laughs> so that's good. We like that, but uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a difficult point, right? I mean, I think if, a computer scientist developed R today, he would do something more like Julia. Julia is a very nice design. Python is a sane design. And R is there and has so much wealth. Right? So you have this thing, right? Which, what do you do? And pragmatically, it makes sense to extend R longevity by a bit. Yes? Yes, yes, it, so, so the question is, uh, are there different styles of programming that will give us different speeds, right? And the answer is yes. So I told you about this copy on write. Well, this copy on write is great for correctness, but if you're unlucky by that, if you write code that, for instance, copies on write more than you think, suddenly, you, I mean, an example is we've seen code that copies gigabytes of data. And why? Because they had an expression that was this long, mathematical, and they said, oh, in the books, they tell us to factorize. So they, they took a bit of that expression, they made it shorter, and they had a function. But as soon as they added the function, that caused copies. And they didn't realize that. Yeah. So uh, just a second answer to that question. To write good past all programs, you need some insight to do that. Yes, you do. It is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yes, the, the, the comment is, at the end of the day, you may need computer science training. But, you know, only, you only hit that from time to time. So, yeah, there is no, you know, there is no silver bullet. At some point, you have to understand what the heck is going on. So the last question, and we are running out of time. Last question, please. Yes? I'm surprised your the title of your speech, because it should be data analysis for the masses, but rather our promotion for data analysis. So, so uh, therefore, uh, I haven't found uh, the uh, aspects of uh, heterogeneous unstructured data uh, uh, real-time theories, uh, what we have in uh, data analysis. And you mentioned at the beginning that R is, is I agree, is statistical package, okay? So, uh, uh, and in your talk, you, 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 you mentioned about data analysis, data science, uh, so all these buzzwords which are, uh, make uh, trouble for, I think, newcomers. Uh, 
So um, I think the, the point of the comment was we were, uh, there are other aspects that were not touched, such as real-time analysis, streaming, which is entirely true, uh, but it's like Excel, right? 90% of people use Excel, and they do it uh, in silly ways, and 90% of people use R in silly ways. And the interesting uses you mentioned are really important, but they're, in some sense, a much smaller part of the population. So yes, masses use R, and masses do mostly silly things, maybe. Okay, thanks again, the speaker, and...